All right. Well, welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Kathy Kyle. Hopefully in talking, someone can just do a bit of a sound check and say, yep, you can hear me. I will be your MC today, and I'm speaking to you from the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, uh, consisting of Siksika, Kanai, and Pikani, the Sutina Nation, the Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation, Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta, where both myself and our speaker, Dr. Keith Dobson, reside. I am a member and current chair of the CVMA Wellness Advisory Group and the leading force behind the Merck Animal Health, which is a company I work for as a veterinarian. And the and CMA, the <laughs> time to talk about um, mental health and vet med awareness campaign, which includes today's webinar. Um, the webinar today is in honor of Ballot's Talk Day about mental health. I am honored to have Dr. Keith Dobson as guest speaker today. Dr. Keith Dobson, PhD, is a professor of clinical psychology who leads the University of Calgary's Depression Laboratory and is a consultant with the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Dr. Dobson will be offering his expertise and insights in mental health. Please note that Dr. Dobson can only offer general mental health advice. If you have specific mental health questions or concerns, follow up with a healthcare provider or make use of the resources provided today. The resources are listed here on the slide and the resources are also in a PDF that is attached to this team's meeting. So thank you, Dr. Dobson, for being here. I will stop presenting and enable the platform to be open to you. Great, thank you. So, so thank you for that introduction and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, like any good academic, I have a slide tray, so I'll be presenting a few slides to, to start the discussion, but I've purposely intended to leave, and Kathy and I talked about this idea about leaving time for Q&A, and I know that a few questions have already been submitted, so we'll try to get to as many of those as possible as well during the presentation. Um, so with that, I'm going to see if I can open up my slide deck. Did it just go live? Yes, it is live. Okay, Good. great. Wonderful. Yeah, Good work. Yeah, Good. You, you never know. <laughs> um, and so it's my pleasure again to, to present uh, to you today. Uh, my email is on this slide and I know sometimes people have questions that they don't either have time or they um, you know, don't feel comfortable asking. So if you do have questions after, you're certainly welcome to send me questions and I do respond to all the emails. I, well, I do respond to all of the emails I get. Um, so just so you know, and also I've shared the slide deck and so that I'm happy to also share that with everybody uh, when the presentation is over. So let's see if we can make this work. Here we go. So here's my agenda for today. And again, I'm planning to talk for about 35 minutes or so of, of this hour. So again, there should be a fair bit of time for, for questions. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'll just start briefly by talking about what is mental health and what is uh, mental disorders. Again, I think many of us have a general sense, but <clears throat> just so we start with some common language. I'll talk about some of our key considerations in mental health. Um, then I'll focus on coping strategies that we can all use and then uh, briefly talk about resources and have, like I said, lots of time for Q&A. <clears throat> Just a warning that you may notice yourself in the slides I present uh, or family members or friends or colleagues and that's just fine. Of course, this would be a clue to you that uh, you may want to take some action and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, so again, this is not intended as a trigger warning, but again, just I'm hoping that is, is relevant for you and will be of some help to all of you. So with that, a few uh, brief definitions, concepts. Health Canada for as long time has had a definition of mental health and mental disorders. Um, so I'll just briefly share with you what that is. According to Health Canada, mental health is the capacity to feel, think and act in ways that enhance your ability, our ability to enjoy life and to deal with life's challenges. So there's two elements here. One is the subjective feelings of, of wellness and you know feeling engaged. And then the other is the ability to manage life's stressors. Uh, so these two components. And one thing I'll just note from their definition, and they flag this themselves, is that the importance of being socially connected is a key part of mental health. And this is a theme I'll come back to later on. 
they recognize that uh, mental health can slip or slide. Um, and so again, they recognize the different signs and symptoms that we can recognize to identify these concerns, like trouble sleeping, difficulty concentrating, uh, if our mood starts to shift, uh, or if, again, we find that we can't cope with life's stressors. These are all good signs. We also recognize that uh, people who are slipping can often restore their mental health if they engage in positive coping strategies and self-care. And I'll, again, I, this is a theme I'll come back to. It also is recognized that almost everybody has a mental health challenge at some point in their life. It's been estimated, in fact, when we look at our diagnostic manual for mental disorders, that in any given year, approximately 8 to 10 percent of Canadians would meet criteria for a mental disorder using fairly rigid criteria pre-pandemic. Uh, currently, it's probably in the ballpark of 20 percent, 25 percent. So uh, many people meet criteria for mental disorder. Lifetime estimates are in the range of 45 to 50 percent. So all of us either I have personally experienced a mental disorder or we know somebody in our lives who has as well. So, so these are not rare or unusual kinds of phenomena. The uh, Health Canada also recognizes, of course, that from time to time people meet criteria for mental disorders, uh, also sometimes called mental illness. Uh, within the field, we're generally trying to not use the word illness because it has a stigmatizing component to it, which again I'll talk about, uh, but mental disorders. And again, these are typically conditions that meet a number of criteria and should be severe enough that they affect our day to day functioning. This slide represents the three most common uh, mental disorders in Canada. Major depression, which is the single most common diagnosis uh, that people can reach in, in the Canadian context. Generalized anxiety, and in fact there are a group of anxiety disorders. When you put them all together, they're more frequent than depression. But as a specific disorder, generalized anxiety is one. And then substance use. Um, again, these are very common conditions in Canada. And in fact, Act. This slide is one of our most recent uh, survey results looking at the annual prevalence of mental disorders in Canada. And as you can see here, major depression comes number one with 4.7% of the population in 2016, 4.4% for alcohol abuse, 2.6% percent rather for generalized anxiety and then there's a whole host of other diagnoses that have decreasing frequencies but there, there, there are many disorders one of the things um, and again I know you're veterinarians uh, or work in veterinary clinics so you're used to the process of diagnosis but one of the things we've been trying to do in the field of mental health even though I've just presented information about diagnosis is to actually move away from this uh, to some extent at least um, oh, actually, I, I had another slide I wanted to highlight about veterinarians. Actually, I was given some articles about the mental health of veterinarians. And this study, which was published in 2020 uh, by Perrette and colleagues, uh, looked at the mental health of Canadian veterinarians. And it suggested that relative to the population at large, veterinarians actually had significantly higher levels of burnout, reported compassion fatigue, anxiety, depression, and lower self-reported resilience based on standardized measures. Uh, they also reported suicidal ideation at significantly higher, 26.2% in the past year, according to this particular survey. Uh, they also reported that females uh, scored worse than males on most dimensions. So, Again, this is not an unusual finding that, that women often have higher scores than males on measures of anxiety and depression in particular. But, but this study I thought was telling that um, veterinarians for, again, I don't know why, but maybe we'll have a chance to talk about it, seems to struggle somewhat more than the average population. Um, this slide also just quickly is uh, looking at changes as a result of COVID. So this is a study that came out of the United States looking at estimates of depression pre-COVID and then post-COVID. Um, so the green bars on this slide are the scores for low, mild, moderate, moderate, severe and severe levels of depression. And the red bars are those um, in the year after COVID, so actually in 2020. So getting to be a little bit older now. 
according to this study, the estimates of depression in, in the pre-COVID period were 9% approximately. In the post-COVID era or in the COVID era, 27%, so about triple. Uh, this is probably a bit high, and what we are now estimating is that rates of anxiety disorders and depression have approximately doubled uh, relative to the pre-COVID era. And again, we'll talk about some of the factors associated with uh, that increased risk. So again, I've been talking about this as a diagnostic phenomenon, which again is an important way to look at this, and it's important to recognize that uh, diagnoses have increased. Um, we also know though that when we look at risk factors, there are multiple risk factors and including gender, as I talked about, having children in the household. So again, those of you who have families around you, either children or in fact, there's some research that suggests people that have uh, blended generations with uh, parents, for example, or, or older people in the household, this is also a stressor. People with financial concerns, um, you know, especially in COVID, if they were unemployed or had significant you know, issues like that and people with exposure to COVID-19 in the workplace, so especially healthcare workers, of course, we see significantly higher levels of distress. This is the, the slide that I was hinting at earlier, which is not a diagnostic framework, but rather a continuum framework to thinking about mental health issues. This is the model that we're promoting now through the Mental Health Commission of Canada, and uh, we're trying to encourage people to think about mental health issues this way for a couple of reasons. One is that we're all on this continuum. So we're all somewhere, you know, functioning in terms of this, this kind of level of thinking. Uh, we have done some surveys through the Mental Health Commission of Canada work. Uh, it looks like, in fact, based on some some ways of defining these categories, that the single most common category are people in the healthy uh, domain, but not dramatically more than people in the reacting domain these days. So in one of the studies we did, about a third of the respondents were in the green level, the healthy level on this continuum, about 25% in the reacting, and then the numbers of course drop for the more severe levels of, of condition. Another important factor about the continuum is that it represents the idea that we can either increase or decrease, you know, so we can slide up or slide down this continuum based on factors that we're facing or conditions we're facing. Uh, so if things are getting worse for us, of course, we can have more signs and symptoms and move up the continuum. If we're coping better or, or if our circumstances change for the better, we can actually slide back down. And so again, it suggests the adaptability or, or the flexibility that we can use. So these are a couple of good reasons for trying to use this continuum model. Uh, I also flagged here that uh, there are two programs, uh, just very quickly, the Working Mind, which is a program that was developed by the Mental Health Commission of Canada, the Inquiring Mind, which is the same type of program, but it's intended for students, uh, and we developed it at the University of Calgary, but they're in broad use across Canada. If people are interested, I could tell more about that later. The model is, of course, much more complicated than just the, you know, the simple four color codes. We recognize that there are a number of different signs and symptoms that people can have that represent these different levels on, on the continuum. And we look at them in terms of mood, behavior, uh, substance use, uh, thought patterns, and so on. And again, there are different signs and symptoms. And, and what I would encourage you to do right now is just take a moment, you're probably already doing this, and see where you think you may be on this continuum in terms of some of these different dimensions. One of the things that many people recognize when they look at the continuum is that they might generally be in the yellow, for example, the yellow zone, but there may be one or more signs or symptoms that are either in the green or the orange side. So again, it's not that everybody has everything all you know down a line in one dimension. There's some asynchrony as we talk about it. You also may recognize that some of these signs or symptoms have gotten worse of late. And in fact, one of the purposes of the continuum is not just to recognize where we are, but also to look at these as changes. And uh, some people normally function, for example, in the yellow zone and seem to be able to do quite well in their life. It's when they shift you know, and start to see uh, increased signs or symptoms, that's the clue then again that something should be done or, or some steps might be taken. 
we also know that there's no single factor that causes mental health problems. Um, so the current framework is the biopsychosocial framework, which recognizes that there are biological, psychological, and social factors that work together uh, to increase the risk or to uh, potentially also increase resilience, you know, to reduce our likelihood of having mental health challenges. And so just like with animals, we, you know, we need to treat uh, people as holistic entities and looking at all of these components. This slide uh, represents some of the key biopsychosocial factors that we think about that are relevant to mental health issues. So again, in terms of biology, there's genetic risk, there's biochemistry, physical dysregulation, substances we take, you know, much, much like for any animal. Psychologically, we know that our beliefs and attitudes can influence the way we think about ourselves and the way we behave, uh, negative thought patterns, uh, helplessness if our behavior, uh, for example, drops below a certain standard, if we have inadequate coping skills or coping strategies for managing life stressors. These again are some of the psychological factors we recognize. And of course, we recognize that you know social issues can also influence our mental health, including past trauma, uh, the way we were brought up, you know, family issues that are ongoing, uh, social support, um, you know, and variety of life events that can occur. So again, you know, the idea that there's a single cause for mental health problems is generally misguided, uh, I would say. Um, and again, what we try to do, certainly as uh, clinical psychologists like I am or psychiatrists, is try to look at the range of factors that are involved. And when we get to the level of intervention, we usually try to recommend, again, different types of interventions depending on the presenting problems and depending on what seems like it's going to be uh, best indication for that particular individual. So just as a way to think about this issue. It was estimated before COVID-19 that about 32%, approximately a third of Canadians who had a mental health problem uh, got some help. You were able to talk to somebody. So approximately two thirds uh, did not. Uh, and a variety of organizations, the Canadian Psychiatric Association, Canadian Psychological Association, uh, the Canadian Mental Health Commission, uh, all recognized that uh, access to care was a significant barrier pre-COVID. Given that rates have increased dramatically, not surprisingly, we actually see a bit of a crisis now in terms of access to evidence-based mental health services in Canada. And there are a number of factors that are involved in limited access, stigma being one. Uh, when we think about stigma, we're really talking about a broad concept that involves attitudes, ne uh, typically negative attitudes towards people with mental health problems, negative feelings, often uh, feeling scared or, or you know, having a sense of um, lack of hope, you know, for example, for people sometimes who are struggling and prejudicial behaviors as well, you know, stigmatizing behaviors or discrimination. We also recognize three different types of stigma. One is what we call social stigma. So this is the attitudes and feelings and behaviors we might have towards other people who are struggling with mental health problems. We also know that some people internalize these beliefs and attitudes, and if they're struggling themselves, they engage in self-stigma. So this would be, for example, uh, putting yourself down, um, maybe not taking opportunities, even if you're you know, fully eligible to, to do an opportunity, you might handicap yourself, so to speak. So these would be forms of self-stigmatization that you might see associated with mental health. And then one of the things that's been looked at a lot in uh, the literature these days is what we call structural stigma. These are organizational systems and structures that make it more difficult for people who are struggling with mental health problems. So this includes things like access to services. Uh, it includes the number of services, um, you, know, you know, just just the systematic barriers basically that get in the way of people getting good access. Uh, for ex again, just very quickly, one example is most mental health programs are open nine to five, uh, Monday to Friday, and getting access after hours is relatively difficult. Um, and so again, if you're a working professional, it's sometimes very difficult to get access to these services. So it'd be an example of a structural barrier that we, we look at. So we recognize that stigma is one of the issues that gets in the way of people getting good access. There are others. 
sometimes people don't know that they're struggling. They don't know where they are in the continuum, for example, or you know that they could benefit. Uh, they may not know where the services are. They may have uh, problems in terms of cost. Uh, so again, in Canada, as you probably know, we certainly do have mental health services that are provided through our provincial health care systems, but they're pretty limited. Uh, so many people end up paying either through insurance programs or out of pocket. And of course, that's not feasible for everybody. So cost can be a barrier. Uh, resources, finding the right caregiver, you know, who provides the right care at the right time can be a challenge, uh, even if you have the resources. And then time, you know, just simply the ability to get there. One of the ironies of the COVID pandemic, in fact, has been that uh, with the move to online services, many people actually have the time, more time in a sense, to get to care than they did before because you don't have the travel time and you know the need to get to a clinic, for example. You can actually do many of these meetings now through Zoom or other technology. And so many people are actually getting access to care that they might not have got uh, pre-COVID. And in fact, it's being expected in the field of mental health that even after the pandemic ends, there will be a continuation of a lot of online services just because of the issue of access and time to get there. I wanted to talk briefly also about stress and anxiety uh, just as a specific issue because I know from the surveys I've seen and some of the questions that I received as well that a lot of veterinarians are feeling a lot of stress and anxiety these days. And so just wanted to point out that, that this is not new information that we've learned just in the last couple of years, but for a long time it's been recognized that there are three primary drivers of stress and anxiety. One is predictability. Uh, and in particular unpredictability. So if we know that a stressor is coming or we think that a stressful event is, is going to occur, but we don't know when precisely uh, or we don't know exactly what form it's going to take, um, you know, th these kinds of elements of lack of predictability increase people's sense of stress and anxiety. Even if we know what the stressor is and when it's going to happen and so on, if we can't control it, we also tend to have more stress and anxiety. So even if we know perfectly that, you know, on a given day something is going to happen, if we don't have effective coping strategies, for example, uh, this is associated with increased anxiety. And then the third dimension is what we call salience or importance. So basically, the more important an event is, uh, if it's coming at us, uh, we're going to pay attention to it more. And, and of course, it's going to drive our anxiety more than events that we don't care about or, or we can somehow trivialize. And with COVID-19, we have all three at play. So it's kind of a perfect storm in some ways because, of course, people have, uh, and, and again, as the new waves happen, of course, and uh, return to school in September, for example, we have lots of unpredictability. Uh, we have lots of lack of control, so we have relatively weak uh, safety methods during the pandemic. And of course, it has huge salience because people have lost livelihoods and lost their lives in some cases. So not surprising we pay attention to it. So the general advice, of course, is we should all maintain public health guidance and then as best we can engage in some of the public uh, coping strategies I'll be talking about in a second. We also know, and this has become more clear over time, that it's not just generalized anxiety that people are feeling with COVID-19, but there actually are two uh, relatively specific types of anxiety that more people are experiencing. One of these is health anxiety. This is anxiety about the illness itself, the risk of infection or the risk of family members getting infected. Uh, for some people, the fear of inoculation, you know, uh, you know, getting, or getting the vaccine and so on. So these are more specific kinds of anxieties related specifically to the health dimensions of COVID-19 and managing it. Then the other is social anxiety. And this has in particular been driven by some of the guidance about physical distancing and the need to be socially isolated. And we know for some people that in fact their sense of concern about others and their anxiety being in presence of other people has actually increased as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So, so again, don't think about anxiety perhaps as a general kind of concern, although some people certainly have generalized anxiety. But again, what you might want to start pay attention to is whether or not people have more focused concerns related to their anxiety. This slide 
Oh dear. Sorry. My, I need to just quickly attend to something in my other room here. It's, it's just something happened here. I just need to be there. Just give me two seconds. Okay, you go ahead. You go ahead. Thank you. Okay. You're Actually, you, you you can look at this slide, this slide, and look at some of the indicators. But I'll be right back. Okay, sounds good. So I, for those of you who have joined, thank you so much. I hope your day is not too hectic. Um, I'm the MC today, Dr. Kathy Kyle. I would, yeah, invite you to uh, read the slide as Dr. Dobson had mentioned, and then I have placed in the chat. Uh, a number of resources such as our Veterinary Medical Association Employee Family Assistant Plans phone numbers. And most VMAs have an association with an EFAP. Please make use of that if you are a member. You often get up to uh, three or four complimentary counseling sessions, sessions free of charge. So it kind of checks the box on that access to uh, a mental health professional. And then in some cases, if you need to continue to have a relationship with the counselor, you're able to do it at a discounted rate. Through that program. Welcome Sorry, back. I'm, I'm back. Thank, thank you. Sorry, that's one of the issues of working at home, right? Multitasking. Well, yes, and we can all relate to that. Yeah, exactly. Sorry about that. Um, we know, of course, that people can show different signs of stress. Again, if you look at the continuum model, this slide uh, represents some of the main things that you may see either in yourself or in your colleagues, or you know, if you're running a clinic, you know, people who report to you. Uh, these are some of the signs and symptoms, again, that have been recognized in different workplaces. And so this is why I've put it up here. The theme, I think, that that is present, though, on the slide is basically avoidance and withdrawal. And what we know oftentimes is when people get stressed or get anxious, the I mean, certainly some people will approach and go towards the problem and try to solve it actively, which is the more adaptive coping strategy. But what many people do is in the first instance, stop, you know, kind of freeze what they're doing, and then they'll withdraw. You know, they'll, they'll sort of step back and then either continue to assess the problem and figure out what they can do or just simply disengage. And again, a lot of times we've seen this in different workplaces where people may have meetings, for example, that uh, people who are more distressed are not attending, or they might be attending a meeting on Teams or Zoom, but they have their camera off, so they're not fully engaged, uh, this, this kind of issue. So again, look for those kinds of issues in your workplace, and these can be signs, again, that something is happening. In more extreme cases, you may see unprofessional conduct, um, you know, people uh, becoming more belligerent towards others, but again, this is relatively rare in my experience. Uh, the other thing I guess in your workplace in particular uh, when you're doing uh, physical work or you know, work with animals is looking for accidents, you know, things that are happening that perhaps shouldn't be happening uh, in the workplace. If, if you see somebody's in distress, and I, I know there's actually a question on this issue, so I'm sort of preempting it perhaps, but if you see somebody in distress, uh, this could be yourself, theoretically, it could be a family member, it could be a co-worker, there are a few things that are generally recommended. First, meet with the person as soon as you can. So don't sit and wait too long. Um, again, that's a natural tendency, of course, to wait and see, but uh, we know for mental health issues that the sooner they're addressed, usually the better the outcome. So try to meet with them as soon as you can. Uh, try to ensure confidentiality. Uh, so again, it's obviously better, better to have these discussions one-on-one -on -one than in a group setting. Assert your position. Let them know who you are and why you're doing this and what your responsibility is. So if it's a person who reports to you in a clinic, for example, you can tell them that you have a responsibility to them as an employee, but also, of course, to the people around and, and the animals that are being cared for and so on. If it's a family member, you can express yourself in terms of your family responsibility and your, you know, your desire just for them to be as healthy as possible. So, so again, different kinds of relationships will lead to different discussions, but let them know why you're talking to them. Don't diagnose, don't tell them what you think you understand about their problem, but just let them know what you see. Uh, you know, I've noticed that you've not been attending meetings lately. Uh, I notice you're coming into work late, you know, and whatever, whatever your observations are and keep it as objective as you can. So, you know, relatively few inferences. Uh, the argument here being that it's relatively more difficult for somebody to 
uh, deny or or pretend that you know behavioral signs aren't there than it is for them to disagree with you about a diagnosis or about your opinion. So try to keep it as concrete and specific as you can. And again, if you're in a position of authority, of course, you may have a responsibility to make sure that you know whatever the behavior is is attended to. Let them know that you're concerned about them. Uh, that you would like to help them as much as possible, that you're there, you know, and this is why you're doing it, that you're not you're not angry, you're not trying to call them out, you know, but you're rather wanting to see if you can offer some kind of assistance. If there is any indication of stigma, either self-stigmatizing on their part, or if you have a sense that they feel that you're judging them, try to address that issue directly. You know, let them know that you're not judging them and that you're hoping that they can do the best they can for themselves. So again, to try to minimize some of these negative attitudes or prejudices and then offer resources. And again, nobody expects you, of course, to be an expert in mental health resources. So it might be that the resource is getting them to go make an appointment with their family physician or to address some of the other resources that I know you have access to. Um, so, so again, encourage them in that direction. Uh, again, you can't make people do these issues, of course, take these steps, but you can certainly encourage it and then offer to follow up. Uh, and in fact, one of the uh, common mistakes I think people make when they raise these concerns is they're often anxious about it themselves. They're they're nervous about raising it, and then the idea that you're going to follow up, you know, makes it even more difficult for some people. So what I would recommend is when you have this conversation, the first conversation, say that I'd like to check in with you again. When can I do that? So actually set a time and day when you're going to check back with them, and then do that. Of course, follow up so that they know that you're you're concerned. It's been noted, for example, that uh, people who take stress leave or have mental health uh, challenges often feel very isolated. Um, that you know, if, if a coworker or somebody has a physical illness, people are quite comfortable asking about it. How are you doing? You know, are you getting better? But when they see people struggling with mental health challenges, they either don't talk about them at all, or if they raise them once, they never bring them up again. And of course, this is quite isolating for the person who is struggling. So the follow up is is very important. So just a brief summary, and then I'm going to switch gears. Uh, basically, you know, we we prefer and we encourage people to think about mental health issues as a continuum rather than diagnostically, uh, recognizing again that people can either struggle more or struggle less depending on you know the these things they're coping with and their coping resources. We do know that even with the severe mental illnesses, if people are given the right care and, and treatments, they can restore normal functioning. Um, again, not 100%. There are some people, of course, with chronic uh, mental illness that, that cannot work or have limitations, but not necessarily, and, and certainly the exception. Uh, so we need to recognize the barriers, deal with them as early as we can. May I ask? Yes, I, I, was, I was just going to take a break. So oh, that's perfect. Yeah, you probably thanks. need to take a sip of water as well. So nope, it's um, okay. yes, it's wonderful information, Dr. Dobson. And there is a question related to two slides past on how do you incentivize someone to seek help when they are unwilling to do so? Yeah, so it, I would say this depends entirely on your relationship with that individual. If you are the veterinarian and it's an employee in your clinic, you can incentivize them, of course, through uh, you know their employment status and you know the ability to work there and so on. So you can actually potentially have those kinds of things. If it's a family member, honestly, you don't have much except your care and concern, and the idea that you know somebody else has noticed that they're struggling and that you know they might want to improve their relationship with you. So I think again, what you want to do, and this is part of the points on this slide, is to affirm your role and your responsibility. Let them know why you're talking to them and what your concern is. Again, you know, sort of why why you're bringing these issues up. But again, if people refuse or deny that they have problems, there really isn't a heck of a lot you can do. Again, unless you're in a position of authority. So I, it's not a great answer, I'm afraid, but I, I think it's sort of most realistic. Um, and there certainly are people I know, uh, in family members. I've heard many instances where uh, family members have been approached and then they just simply refuse to, to take care. So what I would suggest in those cases is you continue to watch. If you see a problematic behavior and you've, you've talked about it and the person has done nothing, you can bring it up again. 
you know, so two weeks later, if the same issues are occurring, you can say, gee, it looks like you're still struggling with, you know, whatever the problem is, you know, have you rethought whether or not you need some help? But again, at the end of the day, you can't make another adult do something. Um, you know, it's a problem. Sorry, is there another question or? Is no, that is uh, okay. the one question that came through and amazingly okay. thoughtful tips. OK, let, let, let me come back then to coping strategies. So just a few general points. Um, first is that most of us manage most of our stressors most of the time. So that's the good news. You know that that growing up, we, you know, we learn some strategies for for managing issues. We also know that no single strategy works for every situation. Of course, you know, you have to pay attention to what's happening and then figure out the best way to cope with it. Most of us have three or four sort of go to techniques that we tend to adopt and use again and again. And most of the time they're probably going to be effective, but it's worth your while to think about things that maybe you can do to expand your repertoire of, of coping strategies that are going to help you to be more resilient, perhaps, or you could again share with other people for helping them if they're managing problems. Generally speaking, we, we type different problem uh, focused and other kinds of coping strategies. So problem oriented or problem focused coping is that where you identify an issue and you go towards it. You know, you, you have a positive attitude. You know, generally speaking, what the problem is. You may have some sense of what uh, outcomes are that you're looking for, and you try to move in that direction. And generally speaking, problem-oriented coping is more adaptive and is associated with better mental health. The two kinds of uh, coping strategies that are generally associated with worse mental health are avoidant coping, so again, where you step away or don't manage problems, because typically, of course, the problems don't go away and may actually get worse by not being addressed. And the other is what we call emotion-focused coping. Emotion-focused coping is the kind of coping that we do when we face a, a problem and we don't address it directly, but we try to deal with it internally. So we might talk to ourselves and convince ourselves that it's not important. We might try to distract ourselves. Uh, we might use alcohol to you know, um, subdue or minimize our feelings. Uh, so we're dealing with the, the internal sensations basically, but we're not dealing with the problem itself. So again, avoidant coping and emotion focused coping are generally seen as less advantageous. Uh, of course, sometimes they're quite appropriate. So if you face an insurmountable problem, sometimes the best you can do is manage your feelings and, and that's OK. Um, but again, generally speaking, approaching problems is going to be better. So with that, I have a number of uh, recommendations. And again, this is sort of like the uh, short shorthand version of, of a number of strategies and this slide and the next slide have a whole host of different recommendations for things that you hopefully are doing uh, as coping strategies but if not you could consider so May these are I interrupt Sorry. before we yeah, move into I, the taking care of yourself dr dobson there was mm -hmm. a follow-up question to oh, how can okay. problem focused coping be used in situations where there is very little control such as the covid pandemic Exactly right. Yeah. So that's what I was hinting at when I said that, um, you know, approach oriented or, or you know, problem focused coping is best when there is an actual problem you can do something about. Uh, if it's in uh, a person that is not going to change or a situation that's not going to change or a major stressor like, you know, the, the pandemic, in which of course is a huge issue, uh, you can't do something about it. So what I would say in a case like that is don't try to solve the pandemic but try to solve specific problems within the pandemic. So for example, if you find that your sleep has become disturbed, that, that's a target that you can approach and you can do something about. So try to break the bigger problems down into smaller problems that you could potentially then do something about. So that would be my general advice. Um, but it is the case that sometimes we have external problems that we simply are, you know, we have, we have no, coping strategy. There's nothing that we can do about it. And in those cases, then we tend to move more towards emotion focused coping, managing our feelings and our responses. So th this list of uh, strategies that I'm going to talk about actually is a bit of a combination of both approach oriented coping and more emotion focused coping. So again, you have you have to be judicious about which is the most appropriate for different problems. It's a good question, though. 
And it's a great segue into the slide. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so there are four different domains here that I'll, I'll talk about. And some of these, again, I hope you're practicing already, but if not, like I say, you know, things to consider. Uh, cardiovascular and strength training. Again, I think we often uh, underplay the importance of our physical well-being, you know, in terms of our mental health. Uh, there have now been a number of studies done looking in particular at aerobic exercise as an antidepressant treatment, for example, suggesting that it's as effective as antidepressant medications in the short term and even more effective in the long term. Um, so, so again, aerobic exercise is something I would encourage for you. The general recommendation is three times a week for about 20 to 30 minutes minimum. You can do more, of course, if you want, and at a level that's appropriate for you. So it doesn't mean you have to go out and run a marathon, but but you know if you get, do something that gets your heart rate up and gets your breathing up, uh, that's sufficient. So, but something regular is actually recommended. Sleep. Can't overstate the importance of sleep, uh, getting regular sleep. There actually are a number of things we can do for sleep hygiene, as it's called, which are strategies for uh, maximizing our sleep potential. And one of the questions, in fact, asked about the importance of, of sleep hygiene. So just very quickly, I'll, I'll give you a few. And uh, you know, again, I can send these to people later if you want. Caffeine. Uh, we know that, again, if you are struggling with sleep, you probably should not be taking in caffeine in the afternoon uh, or later, you know, in, into the evening. So certainly you can have a morning coffee or two or tea, but then or after you probably should limit your intake of caffeine. Nicotine. Again, it's recommended generally to limit your use of nicotine. Uh, exercise actually can help with your sleep. So regular exercise uh, helps the body to feel tired and uh, to appreciate sleep better. So again, it has both the antidepressant benefit and the physical benefit. Um, trying not to eat late in the evening or, or as you move towards bedtime, uh, sort of minimizing those things. Keeping up your uh, consumption of water. Uh, alcohol use is uh, again recommended in limited amounts, but uh, certainly not heavy alcohol use because this can have a backfire effect and can affect your uh, REM sleep. And have your environment in a way that uh, maximizes your sleep. So things like having it dark, having it quiet, uh, making sure that if you can, your cell phone is not right beside the bed. Don't check your cell phone. Don't watch TV just before you go to bed. Try to develop some rituals. So, so these are a few things around sleep hygiene. One of the most important things, though, that we recognize is that uh, the a critical uh, sleep um, treatment or part of sleep treatment we have for most people is to set a regular time to get up like a morning awakening time. So it might be, for example, 7 a.m. and keep that week in and weekend out. So, so basically, you know, even on the weekend, you wouldn't give yourself permission to sleep until 11 o'clock because that will disturb your sleep come the next work week. So try to keep a regular uh, time that you get up. If you want, you can vary the time you go to bed, um, but try to keep a regular uh, wake up time and that'll help to regularize your sleep quite a bit. Um, smaller food portions. Again, you know, eat more healthy food, which is a bit of a challenge in Canada this time of year, but you know, as much as you can, and in particular, fewer carbohydrates. We know that people who start to struggle with their mental health often move towards carbohydrates. Of course, they're simple sugars and they give you a burst of energy, make you feel good for a short period of time, but they don't sustain. Uh, so move more towards proteins and plant-based uh, in intake. Water, uh, can't overstate the importance of continuing to hydrate, uh, taking regular breaks. And again, this has been recommended now for some time, uh, both before the pandemic, but certainly in the pandemic. At least every 90 minutes, you should be getting up and moving around if you haven't. Try to be aware of your emotions. Uh, again, you could use something like the continuum model, you know, to pay attention to different moods and whether or not they're getting better or worse, as, or it's just staying the same over the, the day. Um, if you find that your mood is slipping, of course, this is a cue that there may be the need to take some further action or to get out of the situation you're in or, or to take some other, uh, some other steps. Abdominal breathing. Many people, when they find themselves stressed in a short-term way, can take a few deep cleansing breaths and can actually feel significantly better. 
there are some techniques again I, I won't be able to get into it today but there are some techniques you can learn and practice for abdominal breathing that you can then use at times when you feel stressed so again if you think this is something you can use i would encourage you to to google you know deep abdominal breathing diaphragmatic breathing as a coping strategy and there will be uh, tools online there are many apps also that can teach this kind of breathing self-talk um, I can't again stress uh, too much the importance of the way we talk to ourselves. We know that many people who are struggling with mental health issues are self-critical, uh, self-denigrating. They may feel helpless or hopeless about the situations they're trying to cope with. And the things that you say to yourself are directly and intimately connected to the way you feel and the way you behave. So if you find that you have negative self-talk, try to become aware of that. Um, again, within the field of cognitive behavioral therapy, which many of you have probably heard about, there are three broad types of interventions for negative self-talk. One is to look for the realistic nature of the thoughts and see whether or not they fit reality. Um, and again, that can give you clues for intervention. Just look and see whether or not the thoughts can be replaced with something that's more helpful or adaptive. So maybe not more realistic, but but uh, potentially kinder, more gentle, you know, something again that's going to make you feel better than what it, the first thought was. And then the third kind of intervention is look at what it means to you. When you say something to yourself, what's the meaning or what's the underlying belief that drives that particular thought? And sometimes in those cases, you can identify a belief that's dysfunctional and, and again might be able to be modified. Or in other cases, it may be that it identifies a belief that actually uh, could be the subject of therapy. You know, something you could uh, look at in, in treatment. We also know that if you can increase your appreciation of yourself and others and in increase your gratitude, uh, the sense of what's going well, this can also of course help you to feel better and be less stressed. Focus. Again, there's been lots of advice in the last uh, couple of years about uh, focusing. So very quickly, reducing multitasking, um, trying to focus on one task at a time uh, you know, with minimum distractions if you, if you can or you know, to the extent you can. Prioritize your work. Most people recommend uh, if you can, give yourself your harder tasks early in the morning when you're freshest and then try to do the more menial or regular kinds of events towards the afternoon and evening. Uh, when in fact, I just said that. Uh, give, uh, set up your priorities and your activities for the next day before you leave. So plan ahead if you can. Sometimes this might give you a clue about something you have to set up or arrange that's going to make yourself more successful the next day. Uh, but again, do a little bit of forethought basically about the next day. Um, also, the other one here is about turning off electronics. And again, the general recommendation is that at least an hour before bed, you should turn off your electronics. That, that includes television, smartphones. Um, you, you know, if you're getting phone calls again, you know, these can be distressing to you. So if you can, try to shut them down. Some people I know have been watching television. Uh, you know too much I would say you know they're watching the daily COVID counts for example and again this is not that helpful for many people there is actually not that much new in the news every day so you know think about whether or not you need to be paying as much attention to negative information in particular so and again what this will do of course is free you up to do things that are hopefully more adaptive and more positive one of the things I do, just as a personal example, is every day I have an agenda and I have my day worked out and I usually set some goals for the day. And as the day goes on, I, I you know, draw a line through them and get a sense of accomplishment. Again, it's not, it's not a huge sense of accomplishment, but it's something at least then you know that you're moving in a positive direction. Then the last set of recommendations are around meaning and purpose. When the pandemic first broke out, I was uh, impressed because a number of people said this is an opportunity to rethink my life and, you know, what am I doing with it and, you know, what direction do I want to take? I've heard less of that discussion lately, but it's still the case that, you know, we have, as we go through the Omicron variant uh, wave, the opportunity to stop and think about, again, what do we want to do? What's important for us? So think about your values if you haven't already, and then try to align your life activities with those values. And again, it could be 
be increased socialization. Again, there are lots of ways to socialize, even if we can't be physically present. It could be uh, discovering new hobbies or interests. It could be retiring. Many people have taken the opportunity to retire. Uh, again, whatever it may be. And then commit yourself to do those things and, and make the plans that are consistent with those actions. Uh, most professionals are terrible at taking their entitled vacation. So again, if you haven't taken vacations, uh, something to think about. I uh, already talked a bit about the downtime idea, you know, making sure that you focus on things that are important to you. And again, like I say, commit to doing it. So there's a few ideas. Um, just quickly, again, last slide here. Uh, think about if you are really struggling and you need help, where you can get that help. And again, there are many resources out there. Uh, I think many of you probably have access to EAP or EFAP, Employee Assistance Programs or Employee and Family Assistance Programs. Family Physicians, of course, you, know, can, you can see walk-in clinics, emergency departments are still open and available. Uh, those certainly are not my recommendation as the first line for mental health crises. Um, I think many people don't uh, don't get great service, frankly, in a lot of our emergency departments, but they're certainly available, especially if there's a crisis that needs emergent care. Uh, 911, of course. A resource that's been used a lot is Kids Help Phone. So if you have children who are struggling, uh, especially adolescents, if you wanted to give them this number that's here, uh, certainly you could uh, do that. Every province, I believe, in Canada has uh, something like 811. That's the number we have in Alberta, which is for general health care advice. And again, so making people aware of and, and able to use that certainly is something worth doing. There also are online sources of information, and there's just a couple here quick that, uh, again, if you wanted to look at resources, the Mental Health Commission of Canada actually has a whole set of resources related to COVID-19 and coping with COVID-19, but they have broader information about mental health as well. Health Canada is the same. They have a wide variety of topics about mental health and, and resources and how to access resources. So there's a few things that you can make available. OK, I'm going to stop talking. It's OG. It's 10 to 1 my time. So let, let me turn to questions. Perfect timing to end that portion of the webinar, Dr. Dobson. And thank you for candidly uh, answering the questions with such practical and realistic thoughts. Um, I should will I, open should it I up. stop sharing? Uh, sure. Yeah, if you'd like to, for sure. Yep. I, Unless I, you feel like you may need to, and one of the answers have to go back to the mental yeah, health continuum. Don't, don't think yep. so, but we'll see. Uh, yeah. So I just invite people uh, to type, please. If there's questions, type in the chat. Myself yeah, we, and my colleague will keep an eye on those questions. I'm wondering, yeah. in the meantime, um, if I could just take you back, Dr. Dobson. You talked about a little bit on social media tips already. Mm -hmm. I, Mm -hmm. you know, it was not that much new news on, so manage how much time one is spending on either social media or the real media. Um, yet it seems with COVID that people are feeling more on edge, and I've heard some veterinarians being yelled at by clients mm -hmm. um, who are shaming their veterinary clinic on social media. So what tips do you have on limiting time on social media and or how to mentally cope when reading upsetting or disturbing reviews of one's own business on social media? Yeah, so... so I I guess I'm reflecting if it was a comment about my practice, what I would do. I, I guess the first thing I would do is, of course, reflect on whether or not there's something legitimate in the complaint or concern, and I'd want to address that, uh, you know, whatever the issue is that that's being talked about. So, but it's, if it looks like it's simply a rant or somebody who's distressed themselves, I probably would try to recognize that they themselves probably are in distress. I did read, I know, before this uh, event that uh, veterinarians these days are being compelled to euthanize more animals and you know, in pre-COVID times, uh, that it's uh, economically a more challenging time for veterinarians and veterinary clinics uh, because people have less disposable income. Uh, so I recognize that there probably are increased challenges that both pet owners or, or animal owners and veterinarians are, are facing. So again, try to differentiate the realistic concerns from the the you know the rants and I guess you know to the extent that you recognize it as something that's inappropriate uh, I would say you know cope yourself as best you can try to minimize the focus on it do things that are healthy for yourself um, you know respond to it appropriately but not over like don't don't engage basically if it seems inappropriate there's a few ideas wonderful thanks for sharing and um 
it made me think too that we're never alone in this and that power of social connection. I think that's one of the things you even first men mentioned, like that social connection is such a key point. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of a quote I read in a Johan Hari book a while back that the average square foot of a house has been increasing while the number of close people who we can call on for support is steadily decreasing. So yeah. it's sad to think. And then the power of social connections, even just to get professional reassurance sometimes on those ethically challenging situations where the animal may need to be euthanized. And yes. the veterinarian and the staff recognize that if it hadn't been for limited finances, they could have been able to successfully treat that animal. Just getting professional reassurance that you did the right thing at the time, given one's resources. Yeah. And I, and I presume most of you have communities of practice or colleagues that you reach out to or talk to regularly. So again, you know, you can certainly take advantage of those as well. Yeah, we do. We now have a, a peer support group that has been started by the Edmonton Association of Small Animal Veterinarians, and the information on that peer support group is in the chat. Email me, though, if people need that information. It's available to all Canadian RVTs and veterinarians and student veterinarians and student RVTs across Canada. Great. Um, so I'm just going to check to see if there's any more questions coming in on the chat because we did get some questions submitted ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I do want to honor those, but um, yeah, we'll just keep an eye open for any other questions. And so far, nothing has come in on the chat. Um, I wondered about um, that voice inside our head that our self-talk does tend to be critical and, and really harsh at times. And I think for many of us in the vet profession, that perfectionist tendencies come into play too. Um, so can you talk about why we're cognitively hardwired for that negative self-talk and what we can do yeah. to be less harsh and critical on our own selves? Yeah, one of the uh, ironies, again, of being a, an insightful animal is that we do tend to beat ourselves up from time to time. Uh, you know, we have this level of, of talk. So in psychology, we often differentiate between uh, what we think about as sort of more objective talk. So, so managing situations like, you know, how do I get from point A to point B and so on? So that's not what we're talking about. It's more that second channel, you know, again, where we're obviously uh, making comments or, or observations about ourselves or other people. and, and being critical. We recognize again that people can have different belief systems that drive these kinds of uh, ways of thinking about it. Uh, so it could be our childhood experiences led us to have certain beliefs about ourselves that make us you know, more critical, for example. Uh, many professionals we know actually are perfectionistic you know, as a general theme, uh, not, not just vets I'm sure, but all classes of, of um, uh, of people who are in expertise roles. And one of the things that's, uh, again, a bit of a, a surprise perhaps is that perfectionists often are less engaged and attuned to their own needs than people who are not perfectionistic. Uh, because perfectionists, by, almost by definition, are looking outside of themselves for some kind of a standard or some kind of a, uh, you know, recognition that, you know, they've done the right thing, you know, the, as if there is a right thing. And so it sets them up sometimes for engaging in self-criticism or, or feeling like they haven't met that that standard. So again, what I would encourage you to do if you find yourself being critical, especially around perfectionistic standards, is ask yourself if these standards or these, these goals are really necessary. See if you can uh, attenuate or let them go, you know, reduce or, or let them go perhaps, or if you need to be as driving, self-driving to try to meet these standards. Um, be more kind, more gentle towards yourselves. And especially in a time like this, when we know we're facing a lot of stress, if you can be more gentle or kind towards yourself, that can go a long distance. Words of wisdom, and it makes me think too of the work that Dr. Kristen Neff has done on self-compassion. Mm -hmm. um, and even just like placing a hand on our heart, like that's that somatic contact can just help to release oxytocin yeah. in our brains and dopamine and make us feel so much better. Absolutely. And and for other people too. If you recognize other people driving themselves, you know, if you can just say a kind word or you know put a hand on a shoulder again, this can have a significant benefit for sure. Wonderful. Um, I think I heard you mention this earlier, Dr. Dobson. I just wanted to double check. Did you say that you will make the PDF of your slides available to us? Yeah, I'll, I, I can send them to you right after and you can That's farm wonderful. them out. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah, so for all of those who have asked that question, yes, the PDF of the slides and the recording will be available on the CVMA website under mental health resources in the next day or two. And a big shout out to Lori Haronson, manager of communications, who does all of the heavy lifting in the background to make sure we have the access to the resources both before and also after these webinars. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes left and um, 
We'll go maybe one more minute and then I'll just do some closing remarks. Okay. If I go back to the list of questions that were submitted, um, perhaps I can ask you about um, things, and I liked how you brought in some specific veterinary information and statistics, but we do hear that um, the rate of burnout and compassion fatigue or emotional exhaustion is quite high in with all veterinary professionals. And what, what would you recommend to someone who, if they notice their colleague is just going through the motions and have lost the enjoyment of doing their work, yeah. uh, as a coworker, what uh, you know, yeah, resources so this, could you provide to them? Yeah, so, so this is a perfect example, again, of, of that one slide I talked a bit at length about, about how to approach somebody. Uh, so I guess I would start by asking a person if they notice this in their colleague, what is it that you see? So how do you know they're just going through the motions? Like, you know, do you see lack of enjoyment? Do you see, you know, like, like what are the behaviors basically? Or what are the things the person's saying? And again, if you can find a quiet time to approach them, tell them what you see, express your concern, express your, your compassion for them. Uh, ask them, you know, if they're taking good care of themselves, if there's anything you can do or any resources you can bring to their attention and encourage them to, to access those resources. Uh, again, you can't make somebody do that. Uh, but what we would hope, of course, is somebody who's suffering from compassion fatigue would recognize it themselves, would probably take a step back from their practice, either uh, be less engaged in it for a period of time, possibly take a holiday, uh, look again at the meaning and the value that they're obtaining from their practice, and uh, you know, take appropriate steps, whatever those may be. And follow up, of course, always follow up. Wonderful. I think that'll help a lot of us. And I think that's a good reminder that if people are interested more about the mental health continuum that you shared, that is in the Working Mind course and you're a co-creator of that course. I've taken the course. It's fantastic. And the CVMA is offering the first uh, session of the Employee Working Mind course on April the 7th. The registration will be available soon on the CVMA website, um, beginning of March. It's available to all CVMA members and non-CVMA members and staff. We're hoping to have more uh, throughout the year, fingers crossed. And um, I, so I would just encourage people to check out the registration as soon as possible in beginning of March, because the max per virtual session is 15. So we want to uh, make sure people okay. are able to sign up early. Um, and then I do want to thank you for your uh, oh, that's great. I'm seeing Karen say working mind is amazing. Indeed, Karen, I think you were Thank one you. of the first people who mentioned to me a couple of years ago that I needed to take it. So you were the impetus for all of this. And thank you, Dr. Dobson, for Thank being you. one of the co-creators of that course. Um, and thank you again for your time and candidly answering the questions. So appreciate it. And I do wish everyone the best health and safety and well-being. We're on the webinar today. Um, a reminder for our next webinar in this series will be May, May the 6th with Mary Ann Banton. She's been called the godmother of psychological health and safety here in Canada. And she'll be able to answer top questions on how to improve psychological safety at work, which I Perfect. think will be one of the many ways that we can help uh, deal with the retention and shortage, um, wicked problem that exists here in, in the Canadian veterinary community. Great. Well, thank so, you again for the opportunity. Well, thank you, Dr. Dobson. And take care, everyone. We'll leave, I'll leave the webinar now, but the recording will be generated and on the CVMA website soon. So okay. take good care and take care of yourself. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You. Take care.
It's just too easy to your body. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it does look like it's still recording. Are you able to stop? Yeah. If I go to here and I go to stop recording, stop recording, 